Aloha and welcome. I'm Peter Rossig. I'm your host for the Two Wheel Revolution here on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, this is a program where we talk about actually all kinds of transportation, mostly uh, bicycles and electric bikes, electric scooters and uh, electric uh, uh, roller skates these days, and, uh, and of course walking, which is an important part of personal mobility. Uh, so we have a guest today from uh, AMPO, the Oahu Metropolitan Planning uh, Organization, and her name is Samantha Lara, and she's a traffic uh, planner. Welcome, Samantha. Good nice to meet you guys. Actually, I'm a transportation planner, not a traffic planner. I don't plan for traffic. I try to mitigate it. <laughs> you plan to avoid traffic. Okay, good. That's that's I got got corrected there. That's great. So. Ampo is probably not something that's familiar to many people. Uh, we're in an elevator going up to the 25th floor. So uh, give me your elevator speech. What is Ampo? Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization is what we would call an MPO. And every place that has 50,000 people or more has to have an MPO. And they are essentially the ones that decide where the federal funding goes for various transportation projects in any given region. All right. Well, that's pretty concise. So uh, has Ampo been around here in Oahu for a long time? You know, I, I think most people probably don't even realize it exists. Yeah, it has been. Uh, now, I don't know exactly how many years, but a good while. Yes. Okay. And so in Hawaii, we only have two MPOs. Sorry. So we have an MPO in Maui and then we have an MPO here, too. Okay, well, I guess the MPO in Maui is going to be pretty busy uh, considering. And uh, uh, this, it's been a few, uh, it's been a week or two now since the tragedy they struck there, and our hearts are still torn and uh, by what's going on on Maui. But obviously, they're going to have a, uh, there's going to be a lot of federal money, I think, pouring in there. And then so on, the, the Maui uh, MPO is going to have a lot of, a lot of work cut out for it, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. All right. So we'll talk about Oahu mostly because that's where we are. Um, give me a little more information about how you operate. So we've talked to people here on this program about uh, to the Department of Transportation from the state, Department of Transportation Services, many other uh, agencies. And, and where does OMPO fit into all of that? So Oahu MPO is an interagency organization. So we kind of work with all of these um, organizations that you just mentioned. We work with DOT, so the Department of Transportation. We work with Department of Transportation Services, HART. They're all of our partners. And the MPO is kind of the, the, the agency. I mean, we just give funding mostly. So we have a policy board, and they're the ones that decide on things. They make the the um, decisions on, you know, if a plan gets approved or accepted and we have, we, it then goes into a tip. So the transportation improvement program is where money is allocated for any specific project. So we are kind of the middleman, if you would say it that way, kind of in between the implementing agencies and the community, we try and funnel the community's wishes, what they would like to see into the long range transportation plan, which then is what the policy board, our decision-making body, looks at and approves, or hopefully approves, but <laughs> they can disapprove it. Um, and then it would go on to inform other plans around the island and the different agencies. Okay, so uh, a lot of federal money came into the what we're calling the skyline, Honolulu skyline now, the, uh, the, the rail that's opened and is uh, going part of the way. Uh, does on, what's on pose? Uh, does Ampo uh, monitor that, or does the money come through Ampo, or does Ampo suggest how the that money is spent? I'm I'm really trying to understand how Ampo fits in. Yeah, so the Heart Project is in our transportation improvement plan. It is a project that has been allocated federal funding through the MPO. Um, as far as the design or any kind of decisions that come with the rail itself. That is not what we do. We are kind of the ones that receive the project. They submit the project for funding from us. And then we look at it, make sure that it reaches or makes certain um, qualifications or performance measures or things like that, that make sure it's aligned with the long range transportation plan. And then it would get federal dollars that way. I see. Uh, so, and then the bus also, I, I know the bus here on Oahu uh, has gets, uh, gets some federal money. 
and uh, I think their main their what they're looking for now is is especially money to electrify as an electric bus, one of our uh, our pride's and joys there. Uh, so is it the same kind of process that uh, the federal funds that would support uh, the the bus would come through the uh, uh, Oahu Metropolitan Planning uh, uh, Organization? Yeah, so the funding comes from us uh, for the electrification of all of the vehicles or for updating things. They do studies. They just did a transit ridership study. So kind of looking at what people like about the bus, what they want to see in the bus, and that kind of also guides where that money is going. So um, we fund those studies. We fund any kind of projects they have. They give us kind of their budget. And from there, we we allocate it through the tip. Okay, so I, I don't imagine that uh, there's federal money directly for private electric vehicles, but uh, what about for electric vehicle infrastructure? Is that also something that uh, would come through OPPO, charging stations and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so we have seen the charging stations. I think that they're starting to build them on all the islands. What I remember, we're looking at mobility hubs. We have a mobility hub study that's being done, um, and that's kind of deciding areas on the island in which having a mobility hub where you would have charging stations, you would have dicky docks, the buses would come there, uh, maybe have some sort of convenience measures, you know, maybe like a laundromat or a coffee shop, something that also has things for people to do in that area while they're charging their cars or whatever um, is something that the MPO can fund. All right. Are there any? Uh, do you know off the top of your head if there are there any of these hubs in prospect now, or is that still in the future? I know that they're studying where to put them, and there's been interest on having one in town side, and then maybe one in Haleiwa um, to kind of mitigate any kind of traffic that's coming as they go to the North Shore. Um, right now, there's also a parking study that had been done to kind of see the parking structures that are state owned, how they're being used, and if that space can be repurposed for mobility hubs too. So wow. trying to just reuse our resources um, in a different, more efficient way. Yeah, a parking structure would be kind of an obvious mobility hub. It sort of is right now, but it, it could be turned into something a lot more attractive with, with amenities and, uh, as you say, a place to sit and have a cup of coffee or shop or whatever while your vehicle or your electric bike is charging. Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? Um, not. I don't know that it'd be an actual parking structure, so more like the parking lots, looking at the space. Maybe okay. it's an underutilized space and from there building a mobility hub. Okay. All right. So it would be something you would use the empty space for. So if I have... For, well, first of all, if I have, let's say I just have a great idea uh, for where to put one of these mobility hubs or some other idea, how do I how do I express that? How do I get involved with OMPO or find out what's on the books or, how, or, or can I suggest something? Reaching out to the MPO is a great way to get any kind of issue you want, you know, looked at. Any, if we have an idea for the mobility hub, that would be great. Um, we have our long range transportation plan, which we update every five years. And in that process, we're constantly seeking feedback. Uh, we put out surveys, we have a newsletter, we have a website that we put all of our information on. We're starting to build out social media. So that's a little bit um, new, but we're working on that also. Providing comments when we put out the long range plan or the transportation improvement plan, um, you, the community can just go and literally read those documents and say, hey, I want, I have questions about this project or I have questions about this. And my job as the community transportation planner is to take those comments and to feed them to either DTS or HDOT or HART or whoever needs to answer those questions and make sure that those questions receive some sort of answer. And I also, um, I document all of that. So the questions will be put back on the website. So maybe somebody has a question that's already been answered and they can look back at that kind of Excel sheet and see what's going on. Oh, that's very interesting. So uh, here in Hawaii, we often are in a situation where we're, we're, we're going down a road or a highway or a street or whatever. Is this a state street? Is this a city street? Is this a county street? So if we're not sure, 
and we but we have an idea we could go to you and you'll figure out where who has to pay attention to our our comment is that is that the idea yeah i can definitely um put it to where it needs to be you know so that we get answered but we also have a link um that i believe is on our website if it's not it should be and that one will take you to a map and like a interactive map that will show you all of the streets and who is responsible for which one oh, wow that's again i've learned something right away so that's probably on your website we could find that that would be a very interesting thing. i will double check that it's on there if it's not i can go ahead and send you the link but yeah that is something i get questions for all the time everybody wants to know yeah. is there a map that says which street goes where or who owns it and we have that all right well that that's that's terrific so um and, and if if uh, let's say the city we're always bugging the city uh, bicycle people are always bugging the city for more bicycling infrastructure, as I'm sure you know. So, if does the city then does the bike coordinator or the DTS do they call up Ompo and say, "Can you give us some federal money so we can do this?" Or, or, or what? How does that process work? They would submit projects. So we do a call for projects, and those go on to the transportation improvement plan. And the idea is those projects would relate to the long range plan. So in the long range plan, it says things about safety, or building out bike infrastructure, and then DTS or HDOT, whoever puts in a project proposal um, to the tip, and then they tell us how much money they need, kind of the timeline it would take or whatever, and that project would get funded. Right. But if it doesn't fit in with the plan, DTS is, I'm sorry, Ampo is in a position to say, no, this doesn't fit into the plan. So don't ask, they don't expect federal money. Don't ask for federal money. Does that, does that happen too? Technically we do. So the thing about MPOs is that they vary in size. Our MPO is very small and it only looks at our county. Whereas other MPOs on the mainland look at multiple counties. And in those areas, it's a lot more competitive. So you have multiple uh, kind of transportation agencies putting in a lot of projects. And those MPOs are physically constrained, right? So we can only decide how many projects are going to fit into this budget. And our MPO is smaller and we only have one county. So we're able to do a lot more with the projects because we're all kind of already working together versus having a more competitive kind of system. All right, lucky you live Hawaii. That's uh, one of our favorite sayings. So we uh, we do we are small, but uh, there are some advantages there. Can it give Can you give me an example of a big MPO, a huge one uh, that has all this competition for funds? Uh, TechDot, uh, Texas DOT has very large MPOs. Yeah. Um, I would say California has some very large MPOs. Um, there's one, an MPO kind of in the Midwest that looks at multiple counties, and that one's really big too. So it just, it depends on your population size uh -huh. um, and how big, how many, you know, that means that our MPO staff is larger or smaller, the more things the sure. MPOs can do. Yeah. How many, since you mentioned, how many staff roughly do we have here on Oahu? Uh, right now we have 10. So our executive director just, wrote out a new strategic action plan and that's for the mpo to grow its staff so we're hoping to do more in-house um, projects more in-house studies and just kind of bolster our what we can do in our um kind of jurisdiction as best we can so we will be getting more staff but at the moment i think we have 10. okay mark garrity is the new ompo boss right mm -hmm. Um, we know Mark, he's been involved with transportation here with Hart and with other, uh, with uh, the bus and for a long time. So I think we're, we're probably in pretty good hands there. And uh, the fact that he's going out to try to grow the, uh, grow OMPO is uh, it's a good sign for us, I think. Yeah, we're very excited to be able to do more. I mean, obviously staff capacity is, can be limiting or it can be very empowering. So he's trying to make sure we have everything we need and we can do more things for the community. And my goal is to get the community to know who we are. So that way, if we can use that kind of resources. All right. Do you know uh, roughly how many people uh, are on the Maui MPO? Again, we're, we're, they're gonna be, they're gonna be pretty busy. I do. So the Maui MPO has one person. 
is the executive director. And then she also has one kind of staff person, but it's basically an accountant. So it's not really a planner. Um, and I know we do our best to kind of work with them. We have monthly meetings. We try to, you know, help her as best we can. She's also a new executive director. Uh, so she's kind of on her own learning curve too. But Maui MPO um, is our smaller counterpart. Wow. I think, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that the, that will be beefed up as we uh, look to the future uh, of, of Maui and, and the, the re- whatever happens in the redevelopment of Lahaina. So that, that's interesting. I mean, it's great that there is somebody now who can look at the whole the whole island. So you mentioned safety and, and safety is a big issue for uh, a lot of people, especially people I think uh, who are walking or on bicycles uh, or sk skaters, skateboards or, or uh, whatever. And even in cars, uh, we've had a number, we, we've had this year, we've had a record number of, of uh, deaths due to traffic crashes. I don't say accidents anymore, I say crashes. Uh, and um, e even during the height of COVID, uh, when uh, we thought, you know, things should get less, the, the number of traffic crashes and the deaths and accidents did not fall. And that kind of amazes all of us, I, I think. Um, you know, where does Zompo come into this safety equation and how we can make it yeah, you know, make it safer for everybody, for people in cars, for people walking, for people on any kind of personal mobility. Uh, it, I know it's not your main concern, but I think obviously safety is part of the picture. What is OMPO, where does OMPO come in? It is definitely a main component. I would say that the MPO, our goal, or what we're supposed to be doing is developing uh, a vision, goals and objectives for the region of Oahu. And with that, it's supposed to inform and feed the other plans that are the implementing agency's plans. And so when we say that safety is a top priority, we're making that kind of a performance measure. So that way the projects they submit to the TIP have that built in. How is this safe? How is this increasing safety for our, our region? Um, is this in any way detracting from safety? Are we looking at pedestrian safety or just the safety of the cars, because that's a thing too, right? Putting more roads in is making it safer for cars. We're, we shouldn't be reacting by making it easier for the cars to avoid the pedestrian. We should make it to where the pedestrian doesn't need to be avoided. They're, you know, co coexisting, yes, but not taking a measure to just continue to address cars. I think that's great. I think there's always, or for a long time, there's been a sort of attitude about walkers, and we have a very fun picture of people walking. Looks like they looks like the Beatles going across Abbey Road. But uh, uh, there, there's been an attitude about walkers, and to a certain extent, cyclists and so forth, that it's their fault. You know, they got to watch out for themselves. Uh, cars, cars on the road, and everybody else, uh, you know, better look the hell out. But uh, you know, really, when you think about it, to me, uh, somebody in a in a five thousand or ten thousand pound vehicle covered by metal and protected has a greater responsibility to care for the people that are out there walking or cycling. And uh, if I'm, I hope Ampo looks at it from that point of view. Yeah, and I think I'm also trying to push kind of pedestrian education and awareness. I see where people say that, that it's a pedestrian fall. I don't agree with it, but I do think that we need to build in an educational component so people know how to be, you know, educated pedestrians. It is kind of, it's kind of an art, right? It's not something you just learn how to do or just fall into. You have to also practice being a good bus rider, pedestrian, bike rider, all of these things and be, have that kind of self-awareness. So the MPO is really pushing uh, transportation literacy, teaching people about the transportation modes, the various acronyms that we use, how to be a good pedestrian, how to do all of the things. Um, so yeah, that's how kind of how we're trying to address that. Well, that's great because you're absolutely right. It, it, you, uh, you as a cyclist or a walker or whatever, you do have a responsibility uh, to not, you know, not put yourself in jeopardy or put people, anybody else in jeopardy. And, and after all, if you're a walker or a cyclist, uh, you do have the most to lose from that crash. You do have the most liability and, you know, whether it's fair or not, that's the reality. If there's a, 
a crash between uh, a vehicle and a person on a bike or a walker, uh, I think we all know who's likeliest to to take to suffer. So, uh, but you're right, uh, you know, and bicyclists as well, cyclists uh, need to learn how to do the right thing. And at the end of this, I've got a little, we're going to do a little micro mobility mo uh, moment in which I'm going to talk about uh, e-bike uh, safety. So that's kind of fits perfectly, fits right in. So as you and uh, your traffic uh, planner, uh, transportation planner, I got to get that right. You don't plan for traffic. You're a transportation planner. And if you look at Oahu, uh, what do you, what's your, what am I trying to ask you here? What's the biggest need? Where do you see the, uh, you know, where do you see the friction points? So where do you see uh, what we need to do for the future? I think that we have a lot to, we need to be, we need to work more with the land use people, with the Department of per Permitting and Planning um, to kind of make all of these things work. It's one thing to put in very hard structures, you know, the rail, for example, but it's another thing to also have land use around there to make sure that there's housing and there's jobs and there's things for people to do around these areas. And I can see the need for putting in better bike infrastructure. Hawaii is so beautiful all the time. We have the weather for people to be walking and biking more. We certainly do. So we can have that infrastructure. But part of that is really changing travel behavior. And I would like to see that in our future, really trying to figure out how we can get more young people on the bus, for example. What do we need to do to see more women bicycling? What do we need to see more kids riding the bus? Things like that are part of just travel behavior, which I would consider a very soft measure, not actually building something, but teaching people, making it comfortable for them to want to try more active modes of transportation. And that's only going to work if they live and work in areas where there are transportation possibilities, right? If people have to drive and that's how they depend on things, I get it. I totally understand. But if we can kind of, expand our infrastructure out to the west side to the north shore and create better more active modes of transportation possible for them along with building um, transportation literacy and working on transportation or sorry travel behavior um, i think we can have a much more brighter future that's terrific so you it's not just the hard stuff it's not just uh, you know, it's not just the tracks and the uh, and the stations and the the uh, you know the, con the literally concrete stuff. Uh, it's also how people use it and interact with it that Ampo is concerned about. So that that's a great thing to know. I think sometimes we think, well, it's all you know, federal money is all about uh, pouring concrete someplace and and uh, uh, creating jobs, which is is fine as far as it goes, but. It, after the jobs are gone, we're left with with infrastructure that doesn't necessarily work uh, for the people that are going to use it. So that Ampo right. is aware of that and is is moving about that. That's terrific. Yeah, we want to. I think part of my mission too is I don't want everything to be so much about transportation, getting commuting to work. You want to be able to enjoy the place that you are. Right when people travel to Europe, the first thing they say is everything's walkable. I can walk and have coffee and I can walk here or there. And it should be like that here too. It shouldn't just be us going to work. That is such a really very rigid mentality. We should be able to find things along our routes and in, interact with the community. And I really personally believe that's how you build kind of your relationship with the community and maybe your, you know, more cognizant of litter or more cognizant of what you should vote for. All of these things really play into how we interact with the urban form. And I think that is something that needs to be at a forefront when deciding to plan urban transportation uh, systems. That's great. And uh, you mentioned young people and being, uh, uh, there's a safe routes to school program and some laws mm -hmm. about that. Is that also something that Ampo looks at and wants to be involved with? We do work with Safe Routes to School. So I, we have a Safe Routes to School um, coalition and we meet regularly. I provide any kind of updates or input from the MPO, any kind of things that they need as support from us, I try to do. Um, I encourage them if they'd like to submit any kind of projects to the TIP, more than welcome. Um, I think that children, teaching children transportation literacy is the most, is the most 
important way to change transportation behavior. If we can get them to be using the bus and to feel comfortable riding bikes early, then we're we're doing a great job. And a city that's safe for kids is going to be safe for all ages. That's very well put. That's, I love that. So one more time, how? tell us about the website. Tell us about how uh, individuals can get involved with uh, this Alpo uh, organization. Yeah, so our website will be shared, um, but we post all of our information on our website, um, ways to get involved. I would encourage you to take any surveys that we have, any comments that you have, please send to us. We have a citizens advisory committee that meets on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and that's just reoccurring someplace that you can go hear any presentations that we have from our partner agencies, get updates on their studies. Um, you can always reach out to me if you have a direct question that you would like for me to try and find an answer for. I try to do my best uh, with that. And if we have any events going on, they'll also be on our website that you can come and actually meet us in person and um, ask us anything that you, oh, cool. we can and help the with. The website once again is? It's oahumpo.org. Uh, All right. Samantha Lara, thank you very much. This has been totally enlightening to me. I've always heard of OMPO and had no real clue. And I imagine a lot of people uh, don't, under, don't know either how uh, important, obviously, federal money is very important and federal or, you know, oversight to look, make sure we're, we're all of our various uh, agencies are doing the right thing is, is, is really essential. And uh, uh, I think with Mark and uh, I hope our Maui, our new Maui uh, executive director gets up and running. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're gonna be in very good hands and because uh, the transportation picture is changing here and that's terrific. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciated this space. All right, very good. So we do have, uh, try to end most of these programs with what I call the micro mobility moment. Uh, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not so funny. And it's fitting right in with today's discussion. Uh, next slide, the, the uh, two very prestigious organizations, uh, People for Bikes and the League of American uh, Cyclists, which used to be have a different sexist name, but uh, it's been around for a long time. They have just launched an e-bike education program online. Uh, it's called eBike Smart. Uh, org. You can go there. They have discussions of safety, batteries, and how to deal with them, all that kind of thing. Uh, and so before you get on one of these lovely things, which I think are terrific vehicles, uh, it would really behoove you to go over there and, and uh, uh, learn about the all the th that you need to know about it. And uh, if we go to the next slide, I did promise you a bit of humor. Uh, there's me learning to ride a bicycle at about I think 14 or 15, long after, long after all my peers had learned to ride a bicycle, I finally uh, learned to ride one. And, uh, you know, right after this picture was taken, I probably fell off, but that's okay. Uh, so, uh, and I've been riding ever since, done a lot of, a lot of cycling, and I think it's a great way to, to live. So with that, I'm going to say aloha again. Uh, thank you again to Samantha and to Ampo and all they do. And uh, I will see you again in a couple of weeks here on uh, the two-wheel revolution with thinktech.com. Aloha. <laughs>